I liked it. One of the things that amazes me about these meetings, as well as the IAP course, is how many great ideas would come out. But I hadn't thought of that. But we could do it. Anything else? Okay. The n The next speaker is Nathan Cohen. And Nathan Cohen has a company called Fract Antenna. And he is Mr. Metamaterial. So he's going to tell us about his experiences with these unusual ways to change what we think is material science and metallurgy and what the response of society and publishers were to it, I suspect. Thank you, Rich. Let me see if I can get my computer up here. Let's help you. Thank you. Do you know me? If you look me up on Google, you're going to find out that I'm an Olympic rower who won a gold medal, and I'm from New Zealand, and I'm 29. Not true. <laughs> okay. The reality is, is that uh, although I, in many ways, am, am very much akin to what you're doing, I am an outsider. But I can tell you right now that uh, you folks are exactly what I thought you would be, which is a wonderful group of scientists and engineers who understand that to make something happen, you have to talk, you have to exchange ideas, you have to build on ideas. And I have a tremendous amount of admiration for that. So I'm going to give you an example of some things that may be relevant to what you're doing. Certainly based on what I've seen, they seem to be. But uh, I also want you to appreciate the fact that some of the things you've been up against are still common in modern times dealing with things like paradigm shifts and the equivalent to paradigm shifts in technology, which I call a tortuous path. So I just want to have fun for a second because uh, it, in these days of focusing on one thing, which is what we tend to tell young people, uh, I come from that previous generation, and many of you also are from that generation, where that was the last thing we did. So let, first of all, let me remind you about you know, some of the origins of where we're at. And that is uh, essentially what we're talking about today is transmutation. And that goes back, of course, to Isaac Newton uh, over on the right there, who had this wonderful phrase, among other things, if I'd seen a little further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. I can't possibly imagine why Isaac Newton ever would have been humble with respect to anybody. But that seems to be the, the nature of that quote. The picture on the right is, uh, how many people have this document or have seen it? Review of Modern Physics from 1957, Nucleosynthesis and Stars? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm an astrophysicist, so I, that was beat over the head with that. And in fact, uh, my PhD is from Cornell, and, and Fred Hoyle was a, a visiting professor at Cornell for a while. So he really hit us over the head with it. Uh, the two people that I, I actually know, and Margaret's still alive, are, are shown here. Let's see if I'm going to get this right. So this is Margaret Burbage. She's a remarkable scientist, uh, elderly lady at this point, uh, one of the best uh, optical uh, astronomers of the 20th century. This, of course, is uh, Fred Hoyle. Uh, long story about Fred that I can go into some other time. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, this is really kind of what started all and really talks about hot fusion. What I want to see you, you folks write is the next version of the <coughs> Philosopher's Stone, as it were, which is nucleosynthesis of elements and lattices of condensed matter. So please take it from what it used to be to what it is now, so we can have both, chap both books together. All right, so here's kind of a fun introduction to who I am. Sometimes I look back at what I've done and uh, the various things I've, I've, I've done, and it seems extremely unlikely that one person would ever have done all of this stuff. But uh, it's true, and I'll tell you my philosophy in just a minute. I've been inventing since age six. Uh, I've been around, uh, how shall I put it, the tour of the Charles at various universities. I was here at the Institute from 1979 to 1982. You'd call it a pre-doc back then. Uh, the formal title was Visiting Scholar. Uh, but basically, I had a full-time job before I finished my PhD. Do they still have these things? or? Everything is so structured now, there's no way you can ever do that. Well, back then you could. Um, as I said, my PhD is in astrophysics. I actually did my PhD up at Haystack Observatory, uh, which is part of Lincoln Labs. And uh, let's see, I uh, made several transitions over the last 20 years in particular. 
My emphasis has been on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, I don't have a lot of patents compared to some other folks, but I do have an unusual distinction, which is every single one of them has made money. Uh, for 15 years, I was a professor at Boston University in various departments. I retired in 2001, uh, excuse me, 2002, when I was asked by the Marines to work on, uh, on stuff uh, which was counter IED. I spent uh, eight or nine years doing that, mostly doing classified work. Anyway, I want to give you a sense of, of perspective. And again, for the uh, younger folks in the audience, and that means 40 or less, uh, this is a very unusual perspective, and I want to impart it to you. There are still people around like this. Sometimes they're called flakes. Sometimes they're called mavericks. Uh, oftentimes they're called so-and-sos, which is usually what I'm called. But uh, the bottom line is that my thesis committee at Cornell, at least the original version, contained names that you probably recognize. Frank Drake is the big SETI guy. Any folks here know who Tommy Gold was? Thomas Gold? Okay, Tommy Gold uh, was, a, was a brilliant uh, physicist who, along with Fred Hoyle, worked on the steady state theory of the universe. He also, to geologists, would try to and try to push a paradigm shift on them on uh, the nature of, uh, of of oil as being abiogenic and so on. And you probably all know Carl Sagan. I could give you a bunch of Carl Sagan stories, not all of them necessarily uh, happy talk. But the bottom line is these are the people who influenced me, and the main thing that I get out of working with them was the universe is full of interesting ideas. So this was never a situation where someone said, write a thesis and go and work on that for the next 50 or 60 years uh, ad nauseum. Uh, everyone said, go find an interesting idea and work on it, then find another interesting idea and work on it. And that's really been uh, my path over the last number of years. Uh, and it, the result of this is if you go to various people and say, well, who is this guy, Nathan Cohen, you ever heard of him, what's he done? The astronomers would say my main work has been in gravitational lensing, uh, experimental cosmology. The physicists would say, oh, yeah, he did this really nice proof of uh, closed form analytical solution of frequency invariance in Maxwell's equations. By the way, the, the antenna folks pay no attention to that. The physicists love it. The antenna guys pretend it doesn't exist. If you go to the biologist, they'll say, oh, yeah, he identified the function of that, that, uh, or, that organ called the melon, which is in the head of adonocetes and dolphins. And what the melon does is it's a highly dispersive prismatic structure which generates an interference pattern sonically, ultrasonically, uh, in front of the dolphin. It uses that with sort of like shadow and light equivalently uh, with sound uh, to generate these moiré patterns and to figure out images. Uh, in imaging and optics, I'm the first person to do real-time deconvolution on a large scale. And when I do mean real-time, I mean, you know, 16, 20 frames a second. That was quite a while back, and now that's become standard. Uh, I'll get to radar in a second. If Again, I've really been interested in a lot of problems. Some people will consider this kind of, you know, fringe, as it were, which is the search for extraterrestrial life. As I said, Frank Drake was my thesis advisor, so I did some work on that. Um, radar. Well, I'm not really a radar person by a long shot, but as you'll see in a second, I've solved the problem, or rather created one for them that uh, they're very interested in. But most people know me as being an antenna guy, and if you go to antenna folks, they'll say, oh yeah, it's that so-and-so, and I don't mean so-and-so, uh, inventor of fractal antennas. And the reason I'm a so-and-so, as you'll find out in a second, if you didn't from my comments earlier. <laughs> but let me get to the bottom line, which is, uh, Mitch had alluded to the fact that I was going to talk about metamaterials. This is not a metamaterial lecture per se, but I did want, want to impart something that may be of interest to you. Uh, what this is is, uh, is a bunch of circuit boards which are formed together into a cylinder. And you can see it has a bunch of these little resonators which abut each other. So it's kind of like this doily-like pattern, but each one of them is a, is a fractalized loop. And uh, there are two layers of these fractalized loops, and then there's essentially a mirror on the inside. In other words, it's a uh, sheet of copper. And if you hit this with microwaves, what happens is that the incoming wave uh, uh, goes and then bounces back uh, and phase cancel it, cancels with the incoming wave. And so what you end up with is zero backscatter, out of phase, reflected wave, in phase, incoming wave. So you end up with zero backscatter coming in this direction. And using the fractals, we can get that to be about, uh, about a 2 to 1, 3 to 1 bandwidth on reducing the backscatter. 
But more importantly, what happens is, I'm going to skip side scatter because there isn't much, is uh, you generate, because you're impinging a traveling wave on these guys and they're, they're resonant, and the fractals are resonant over a large range of frequencies, and you get two layers, so it's even better, you end up generating a surface wave which propagates in all directions at the speed of light, and the surface wave becomes a dominant term. And what you end up with is something like this. This, is, uh, this diagram illustrates what would happen uh, over a passband of 500 to 1500 megahertz if you had two antennas just communicating directly with each other. And then you put something in the way, and the something in the way down here is this uh, young man named Peter that I just showed you. Let's go back to Peter. Peter's the first person to be cloaked, by the way, at microwave anyway. And so what happens when you stick Peter in the way uh, is you end up with this, this nice profile where you've got a reduction in gain. The reason it doesn't go down 100% is because the power pattern of the two antennas is slightly larger than the region you're actually trying to, uh, to cloak. But you can see, you know, he's, he's a, pretty good, he's a pretty, good, pretty good door. He's a pretty good block. And the point is if you then stick this, these two layers of these fractalized metamaterials on top of Peter with a boundary condition, you end up with something very unusual, which is this. In other words, the intensity for a large fraction of that passband has gone back basically to zero, as if there's nothing there. In other words, you've produced forward scatter. You almost never talk about forward scattering in, in radar because no one's really got much of it before. So uh, this is a way of getting the forward scattering. And because you're essentially using the surface wave to take uh, the electromagnetic uh, traveling wave around it, uh, you'd call it cloaking because you can't see what's in the middle. You can only see what the surface wave is propagated to the opposite side. So this is kind of fun. It's, it's created a whole new technology. Needless to say, people are also doing cloaking using non-fractal methods, and they are not succeeding. They're getting very high Q results with relatively high loss. So uh, we're many steps ahead of them, and I will announce now, Barry's my chairman, so he's looking at me like he's wondering if I'm going to say it. Uh, what we've also done is uh, we now have a system that allows you to tunnel out of this by replacing the inner, uh, inner boundary condition by, instead of a, a continuous sheet of copper, we're using a fractalized scatter with a lot of holes in it. And you can essentially, it's probably the right word to use, I've seen other people use it, tunnel out from inside. So you can look out at the same frequencies as you're being cloaked interesting result and uh, going to be publishing that fairly soon. All right, well, I want to show you a couple of these results because the rest of the talk is really talking about uh, innovation and how you push new ideas, and I do mean push, and uh, some of the things you're going to be up against. A lot of you have seen a lot of these in the context of a paradigm shift. There's more than just a paradigm shift going on with cold fusion. But just some fun pictures. You already saw a picture of Peter. Uh, my dad and I started uh, the company Fractal Antenna Systems in 1995. You can see a lot of it was really uh, humble. Some of it was done in my basement. Uh, here's here's my, my research staff from 1984, 1994, sorry. That's my son, Alexander. Uh, here you can see I'm holding a uh, bent wire antenna that's made out of uh, uh, bent aluminum. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, high-tech equipment I was using, which was purchased at the MIT flea market, I might add. I don't know if any of you folks have heard of the famous MIT flea market, but it's a great place for getting uh, good stuff cheap, especially when you can't afford to get, get real stuff. Just a very quick aside here, which is going to feed into the discussion that I'm going to uh, jump into, and that is when all this stuff was being done in the early 1990s, I was a professor at Boston University, and I thought, well, this is fun. Let's, let's do some stuff on campus. We've got a huge room in the building I'm in. Uh, let's make it into a portable chamber. I'll bring in my own equipment and break it down and so on. Well, I quickly realized I had enough equipment that I bought at the MIT flea market that I was needing to store this somewhere. and I couldn't put it in my office. So I went to my dean. I explained to him what I was doing. I then uh, asked him if I could use the vacant closet that I saw down the hall. And he said, well, I'll get back to you in three weeks. So he didn't get back to me, but his secretary eventually got back to me and said, no, they don't want to give you the closet. And I said, why not? She said, well, because 
fractal antennas already exist. I said, really? He said, oh yeah, yeah. My, uh, my friend has a uh, uh, fractal antenna on his car. He broke the antenna off his, his AM radio <laughs> antenna off the car and he put a coat hanger on there that was bent. So, uh, so everyone already knows about fractal antennas. I, now, I, I'm not trying to pick on Boston University per se, but the bottom line is, is that these kind of irrational responses are very common in dealing with new ideas. Uh, here's a few uh, fractal antennas. I've only shown two-dimensional ones. The only one that I really want to show you right now, these are three-dimensional, but they're hidden in radomes, unfortunately, is, Mitch, this might be of interest to you. It might be kind of cool to make your cathodes, not so they're just, where are you, Mitch, helices, but these sort of, uh, you know, doily-like helices using fractals. We've actually made antennas that are fractalized helices. So I think it would be very interesting. I don't know if the notion of, of Q is relevant to your metamaterials, but I can guarantee that if it is, that this will lower the Q, which may allow you to get a greater yield. I, I'm only speculating by saying that. But yeah, it might be kind of fun. Area. I'm sorry? And increase the area. Uh, oh, it will absolutely increase the surface area, right? Because you're increasing perimeter dramatically. Okay, so uh, some of you folks heard me uh, on Friday interject very animatedly when I saw all kinds of fractals happening in your experiments. And so let me make, make an, an incredibly important point, which is most things in the universe are fractal. And when most things in the universe are fractal, using the word fractal as a description has almost no meaning. So calling it fractal is, is, is fun, it's great, but it isn't telling you a physical mechanism or a physical method to solve the problem. What it does do is by putting it into that class, it allows you to use fractal techniques as a diagnostic to, to describe what you're working with. And it may also be important in solving the problem. But it'll be a subclass of fractals that will be relevant, not just the fact that it's fractal. So please like you know, all the experiments you've done. If you do one and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean you stop. It means you try something else. In other words, if you work with some fractals and you find out it's not helping, that doesn't mean all fractals won't work. Certainly that's true in antennas. But let me show you this, because I was talking about, gee, you know, if you use a fractal and it's, it's radiating RF or whatever, if you're talking about any kind of resonance, uh, what does the passband look like for, for example, an antenna? And this will motivate that answer. Uh, what this is is, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit ratty. It's actually a historical diagram from 1995. Um, what I've done is I've taken a a loop antenna, it's called a quad, and this is one wavelength in size, and I said let this be six inches by six inches. Now what I'm going to do is something simple, make a very simple fractal by, in this case, first thing, just putting a rectangle every time I see a straight line. That's not really a fractal yet because a definition of fractal, and there's a lot of definitions, but the very, very fundamental aspect of it is there has to be some degree of self-similarity, which means you have to have something that looks like another scale on that same object. So there's nothing here that, that looks like it's of a different scale. So this is only one scale. So you're not quite at a fractal yet. But now if you take each one of these lines and put a uh, rectangle on that and so on, then you get this. So there's two orders of scaling now in this structure. It's kind of looking like a Coptic cross. And then you can do it, it's cut off here by the way, just in the picture. But uh, this would be three of them and so on. Well, the point is if you still can uh, force that to be in a form factor of six inches by six inches, what happens to the resonances? Uh, this is an early picture, and that I'm showing more historical. Obviously, there's much better data today, uh, 20, 25 years later. But this is a, a passband indicating zero to a thousand megahertz on all these diagrams. This is return loss, which is a, a way of, um, it's, it's essentially the modulus of the reactants uh, uh, to a 50 ohm uh, match. And the point is, if you get one of these dips, it means you're getting very close to 50 ohms real at resonance. So the deeper this is, the closer you are to resonance. Minus 10 corresponds to, if you're talking about SWR, which is what engineers like to often talk about, this is about a 2 to 1 SWR. So, you know, that would be considered a band or a feature or a resonance of an antenna. So what happens is that if you take this guy goes with here, this guy goes with here, this guy goes with here, and so on. Let's go to the second iteration and compare it to the zeroth iteration, nothing applied in the rectangles. You can see that this resonance has gone down in frequency, and there's a whole bunch of other weird stuff that's happening here. 
So one of the virtues of, uh, of fractalizing a resonant structure electromagnetically is that it loads it. Essentially, it lowers the frequency. Call that inductive loading. It's a lot of length going on here. That's why it's inductively loaded. But there's also some capacitance uh, happening here as well. So it, it becomes asymptotic as you do too many iterations. So the bottom line is you're generating many of these features. They're not harmonic. All right? No one fully uh, understands analytically how to solve this. It's been done numerically, of course, and experimentally we see these features all the time. But uh, if you keep on going up, well, here's just one. Sorry, let's concentrate on one, and I'll show you what happens if you go up. So here's the dipole, and here's a simple one where you're just putting a triangle on there. And what you see is uh, this picket fence behavior. This is a fundamental frequency, and it's harmonics fully expect it. What happens if you stick this structure on your, say, dipole? Well, you get your fundamental frequency and then you get a waveform of your harmonics. And it looks like the, uh, the SWR, this is 1.5 to 1, this is 50 to 2500 megahertz on, on the frequency range. You can see this waveform is pushing it down to a very good match. And when you start doing a second iteration, in other words, increasing the fractal, increasing the roughness, uh, you can see you get this really, really wideband behavior at higher frequencies and a lot of very picket fancy stuff at the lower frequencies. So what I'm saying is that if you're looking at RF emission, uh, or infrared for that matter, it isn't necessarily a gray body. It could be one of these rough fractal structures and a characteristic of that will be you get these non-harmonic multiple high Q bands at the lower frequencies and a totally broadband resp response at the higher frequencies. So if you see that, it's a signature that it's some kind of fractalized surface. I can't tell you which one, but uh, you don't see that with behavior of other kinds of structures. So I just want to show a few of these. I call these melds. In other words, when you get these resonances all kind of joining together, making one continuous band, we call that a melt. And I was just showing that this is an overall behavior of fractal antennas. Uh, that's your dipole, of course. Um, it doesn't really matter how you do it. You always get this wideband behavior at the higher frequencies. Uh, by the way, those diagrams, everyone's saying, well, give me a reference. I'll give you a reference. It's in a book that's coming out this summer called, uh, it's a memorial book for uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, the author is Michael Frame. And this is my friend and colleague, uh, Benoit, who passed away uh, about four years ago. And it's my favorite shot. Just, all right, so what I'm going to talk about now is more innovation-oriented. I'm going to talk about paradigm shifts very quickly and then go into the innovation stuff. So being a scientist, as, as most of you are in this room, you, know, you realize that uh, human behavior being what it is, you always can't say it always is a certain way. So I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say the results I'm going to give are often but not always true. Uh, and I'm going to say it's an opinion. And you're wondering what my database is. A lot of it's historical. You'll be able to see uh, some of the things uh, uh, directly to some of the inventors and the innovations that you're familiar with. A lot of it is personal, what I've been through. And oddly, enough of it, enough of it is actually from dealing with the experience of others over 25 years, talking to other inventors, other innovators, and frankly, talking to a lot of customers, many of which have gone out of business. So what I'm going to be discussing is not something, because it often deals with failure, it's not something that people like to talk about. And frankly, it's because of the, you know, the Western culture where you're just not allowed to, to recognize and accept and move on from failure. You just don't want to talk about it. It's part of the problem. All right, well, let me just draw a distinction here because I'm going to talk about paradigm shifts very briefly and then talk about something called the tortuous path, which is the equivalent of paradigm shifts only with innovations in technology. Uh, I'm sorry to draw these distinctions, but again, Often, but not always, okay? Scientists tend to be reductionist and they want insight into process. Technologists are actually, if you had to draw a distinction, quite different. They tend not to be uh, reductionist. They tend to pull things together that may not make any total logical sense and is certainly not, uh, how shall we put it, small uh, additions to the, to the art. They tend to be generalists. They want insight into the end user's applications and needs. The two are diametrically opposed worldviews. It's extremely difficult, and I know many of you have done it. I'm hearing it today, I heard it yesterday, I heard it Friday. It's extremely difficult to have both worldviews, to be uh, an innovator slash business person 
and the scientist. One does not immediately segue to the other, and to be able to do both at the same time is, uh, uh, yes, it's that. It's extremely difficult to do, and the people in this room who are doing it can probably take you out for a beer and talk to you for hours about it. So let me give you the bottom line, and this is why it's important to cold fusion. You've already heard this. I'm glad you're hearing it again. It's not a new idea. The su successful applications drive the science funding. The Z comes before A. There's been 25 years of, frankly, good science on, uh, on cold fusion, LANR, LENR, but the bottom line is that everyone's saying, when am I going to get the box? When am I going to get my little uh, uh, heat generator? When's it coming out? You have to concentrate on getting some applications out. You don't have to solve all the world's problems first, but a majority of people who are important will not pay attention to what you're doing, and it's extremely important, I might add, they will not pay attention to what you're doing until that application comes out. All right, so let me, let me talk about this. I understand uh, many of these people are very familiar with the structure of scientific revolutions, in part because you're trying to figure out what the hell is going on with me. I'm doing all this good science. I'm giving people factual data. It's all high signal and noise. I'm not over-interpreting it. And they're dismissing me, or they're saying it's wrong, or they're denying it. So you go and run and see where has this happened before, and you run into, of course, the structure of scientific revolutions. And uh, that famous book by Thomas Kuhn talks about paradigm shifts which are relevant to research groups who themselves are looking into the idea of insight into nature. Paradigm shifts, more of that in a second. By the way, the reason I'm even talking about paradigm shifts is not because most of us in the first and second third already know well about them. It's because the folks who are 20, 30 years old, still in graduate school, you may have heard of Thomas Kuhn, but no one said go and read it. And you certainly hadn't envisioned the kind of hassles that you go through to come up with new ideas and push them through. The point is, is that innovation uh, deals with something that I'm calling the tortuous path. It's a coin term. Uh, and it deals with companies and institutions, not just research groups. And the objective is uh, progress in the human condition. I'm not separating that, per se, from science. The point is, is that directly, as scientists, we're trying to get insight into nature. And then we're interested in the application. All right, so I'm going to talk about paradigm shifts very briefly. And, uh, I want to be a nice guy about this. There's all kinds of nasty things I could say, but it won't accomplish anything to say it quite that way. So uh, let me talk about uh, basically uh, several points that emerged either directly from Kuhn or have been recognized by people since that time. So paradigm shifts are violent and painful upheavals in working hypotheses in scientific fields, and they succeed long after compelling data supports the new paradigm. My point is, is that just coming up with the facts is not enough to have an acceptance of a new working hypothesis. The opponents are usually, but not always, the leaders in the field. Okay, The leaders in the field are usually the last to adopt, if they ever, paradigm shifts. And they're often a rational emphasis. I'm not going to lecture to those who've already been through this to a degree that I can't possibly imagine. I've been through it myself. You know what I'm talking about. There's no rational path to acceptance. That's just how it is. It doesn't matter how much data you show people, how, you, how much you invite them in, it's still going to be a problem. I refer to this word stasis, meaning you're not going anywhere. It's enforced by a social institution, in this case, say, the field you're in, uh, or that it's supposed to be in. The denial is palpable. The opponents, and this is not me being morbid. This is Kuhn pointing out how it changes which is really kind of startling. The opponents die out. In other words, unfortunately, you have to wait for the demise of the opponents for this really to work. Now, a number of you are probably thinking, oh, well, this is about Galileo in the Middle Ages or so-and-so 100 years ago. No, 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 no. Human nature has not changed. We have better communication, but it's still happening. Uh, and finally, I want to say uh, the silent proponents, proponents, uh, get over the hump by pushing the new parad paradigm when there's a vacuum of opposition. Vacuums of opposition happen when people who are opponents retire, and again, unfortunately, who would want this to happen, but when they pass, when, when, they, when they die. So uh, I, I do want to point out that in my opinion, you're in a position now with cold fusion 
where there's a vacuum of opposition. I don't think you see it yet, but I think you will over the next year or two. And I'll, I'll talk about that personally after, after my talk. All right, uh, again, this is mostly for the younger folks. Uh, there's a number of, of very famous paradigm shifts. Uh, in my opinion, cold fusion is, is without doubt the most important paradigm shift, the most painful paradigm shift. It's just off the map compared to anything else. And I'm already referring to the Copernican Revolution. I'm already referring, referring to uh, continental drift. All right, How you guys survived the last 25 years requires, requires nothing but admiration. All right, well, anyway, so for the younger folks, let me just point out what's usually considered the most famous con uh, sh uh, paradigm shift, which is continental drift. And by the way, these astronomers are pesky. They're all over the place. All these people that come up with these wacky ideas often start out in astronomy. So I just want you to know that. You can always blame the astronomers, and, and, and they're used to taking uh, uh, arrows in their backs. All right, so Alfred Wegener was an astronomer and meteorologist. Uh, he came up with this idea of continental drift based on the pale paleontology evidence and, of course, the uh, geographic evidence. You already know that. What you didn't know is that uh, uh, the paleontologists basically told him to stay out of their field, and it, they totally dismissed him. Even when he was in the audience, they never even gave him a chance to respond to the criticism uh, at a famous meeting in, I believe, 1930. So the result was is that even though there was plenty of data, uh, Wagner still felt he had to go out and get more data. More data was going to convince people, and he took it to, unfortunately, a point where uh, he was in Greenland and passed away of a heart attack trying to gather more data. Don't do that. <laughs> Now here's a really interesting point that I want you to remember, um, that it was predominantly the paleontologists that were against the idea of continental drift. It was usurped by the geophysicists. The geophysicists created their own field, they got the funding, and they said, we're just going to ignore the paleontologists. The paleontologists were essentially uh, championed in this regard by uh, George Gaylord Simpson, uh, he retired at about the same time the geophysicists came in. What a surprise that was. And by 1965, basically the notion of continental drift and plate tectonics uh, became the dominant paradigm for uh, the uh, shape of the Earth, the surface of the Earth. Let's see if I can go here. Okay, I'm going to be very gracious on this one. Um, I want you to read the title of this book. I know many of you have seen this book. You're still upset to see it. Some of the younger folks may not even be familiar with the fact this book exists. I bought it in 1994. I still have it. I was shocked. But I want you to realize what the title says. Cold Fusion, the scientific fiasco of the century. That sounds pretty definitive to me. Now, I'm not here to pick on the late John Hazenga, but I am going to criticize his comments. So let me point out what the real scientific fiasco of the 20th century was. It was called Lysenkoism. Any of you familiar with Lysenkoism? OK, all right. Well, the reason, uh, the notion of Lysenkoism, which was done in the Soviet Union, was that uh, in order to improve especially the wheat crop, let's get rid of Mendelian genetics, and let's think about doing grafting and hybrids. And if you do hybrids, it'll acquire the new traits. It's really Lamarckianism. And to heck with Mendelian, you know, uh, Western conspiracies. All right, so the Soviet Union bought into this notion, and the result of that notion is that millions died of starvation. It probably was responsible in part to the uh, demise of the Soviet Union, and of course, it, it really destroyed science in the Soviet Union for many, many years. So let me remind you that cold fusion, no one's died from it, okay? No government has toppled from it, and no scientific endeavor has been stopped by it. And as they say in Monty Python, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> All right, so let me now talk about from paradigm shift to the analogous uh, notion of what happens in technology. I am writing a book. Uh, cold fusion will not be in this book. The reason it's not going to be in this book is cold fusion needs a separate book. So uh, if you want to use some of what I'm going to say today and ultimately in the book as uh, examples that will help you understand, that that's my objective here. 
Uh, the title of this book has actually changed a little bit. It's now uh, Innovations, Perils, and Progress. And it's going to be finished later this year. So the tortuous path is the process of the path that an innovator takes to deliver the innovation to the end users. You come up with innovation, sounds obvious, you get it to the end users. Well, it is obvious, but it's not easy. And let me tell you why. The adoption of the innovation is seldom controlled by the end users. It's controlled by a whole bunch of folks in between, and here they are. Your competitors, the competitor affiliates, it's often the people who work with or vendors for the competitors. Uh, the media, the media is almost always against you in the sense that they love controversy. Controversy sells. If it doesn't exist, they'll make it up. I know, I've seen. You have too. <laughs> investors, oddly enough, investors are uh, some of the, the worst in terms of making pitfalls for innovators and innovations. Uh, you've already heard about the government agencies. Patent office, going to talk about that. Uh, oddly enough, nonprofits. I think uh, Larry actually referred to that yesterday. Nonprofits often take this notion of uh, we have to attack these dangerous new technologies as a way to gather funds and so on. And finally, the sirens of titans, which are people who just uh, malcontents that love to say anything in order to see how you react. All right, so the torturous path is full of pitfalls, delays, and death. I'm not going to talk about death, but I am going to talk about the pitfalls and the delays. And I'm going to motivate this with an example. See if you can guess what paradigm shift this responds to. Take a second and read it. Especially the quote, shall I refuse my dinner because I do not fully understand the process of digestion? <laughs> Anybody know what field this is? Ulcer, uh, the ulcer, uh, pylorus. Uh, oh, E. pylori? Wow, that's a really good guess. Uh, but that's the whole point, is that this happens again and again. Unfortunately, so. Heavy side. Sorry? Heavy All over heavy side. Very good. Excellent. Superb. Okay, this is about radio. There's uh, Marconi. It started out as wireless. It became radio. Just so you know, wireless was not a success until the 1920s when it became radio. Before that time, it was unreliable. No one really understood how it worked. There are obviously hypotheses about the ionosphere. Till Appleton was able to prove that there was a conductive layer up there and so on. He got the Nobel Prize. Uh, let's see on some of the other things. Uh, you, had a, you did a wonderful, uh, thank you very much, and I'll show you, have a side in a picture. Do you know who this is? Uh, founder devised a technology to talk to ghosts. Edison. Uh, that, that's a very good guess. Actually, to call it the founder is a little misleading. One of the founders. Hertz? Another good, good notion, yeah. No, actually, it was uh, Oliver Lodge. Oliver Lodge was the, was the person that came up with the notion of synthety, which we now call resonance in electronic circuits. And uh, he thought radio, and it's really tragic, he thought radio could be used to talk to his dead son. So, you know, the point is, is that these things happen in ways that don't make a lot of sense. And the other thing that I really want you to pay attention to is that the whole way that radio played out was a mess at the patent office. And it became a Tower of Babel. You had a whole bunch of people doing innovation in radio that were out at each other's necks constantly. There's Oliver Heaviside. Thank you very much. All right, so please don't answer the question. Let's see if anyone else gets it. Can you tell me something else that Oliver Heaviside is, is well known for? There's probably a, two, several things. but His haircut. His haircut. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> Oliver Heaviside is the one that reduced 11 of Maxwell's equations down to the familiar four that we work with today. Uh, he appeared in the, uh, in the musical Cats. <laughs> Very good. The other thing is that he wrote the paper that predicted Cherenkov radiation. This guy was really out there, really amazing guy. OK, I'm going to skip some of this for the sake of time. The bottom line is, is, that, is that companies usually make improvements in things. They don't make innovations. And innovation is a uh, process that, that leaves a, uh, a jump uh, in, uh, in the process rather than a small uh, incremental step in improvement. And I'm going to skip some of this, especially in the innovators and talk more about the pitfalls, because this is really what you're going to be up against. So there's end users, and here's innovator, and you're trying to get the innovator over to the end users. So here you go. You've heard some of these. You've dealt with some of these. You've probably never heard them categorized. There is a finite number of them. So 
uh, please see if you can identify them uh, in your own experience. Uh, so the first thing is fear factor. Okay, well, one of the main uh, problems with innovation is that uh, people uh, tend to be... All right, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, uh, people don't like change. That's just the reality of the human character and your competitors, a bunch of other folks, are very interested in seeing you fail and they'll try to concentrate what they consider the weaknesses. In cold fusion, it's kind of obvious what someone might want to call some of those. Oh my God, it's radioactivity. It doesn't matter that it's in such small byproducts that uh, you don't have to worry about it, but you're going to have to address that issue up front every time you talk about it. Say this is never an issue. You probably experience more radioactivity when you fly at 30,000 feet from cosmic rays. Uh, sabotage, I'll get to that in a second. I know you hate to hear that word, but it's just a reality. The Cinderella syndrome, some of you have already experienced this. The Cinderella sy syndrome is a, uh, is a pitfall that happens because investors want to see return their investment in a finite period of time. So they will do stuff like fail fast, meaning I'm going to give you three years or two years of money and then we're going to close the doors. All right, this is built into the system of investors because they're trying to get a quick return and they hedge their bets with a number of different companies. So the fact that there's a term for it, fail fast, is a little bizarre. Patent napping, okay. <laughs> patent napping refers to the notion of, in this case, the patent office taking too much time to process your patent. It still happens. It used to be a lot worse than it is, but you can easily still wait five or six or seven years for a patent to come out. Now, my record so far, and I'd be interested to know if someone had to wait any longer, is 12 years. Can anyone beat my 12 years? Hey, I'm a winner, <laughs> which really means I'm a loser. Now, the bottom line is that you, know, you put it in, you wait. In my case, one of the patents took 12 years to come out. That profoundly affects how you uh, deal with a company. Um, there's another form of patent napping that I'll refer to in a second that is far more nefarious and has nothing to do with a patent office. Regulation, oh man, you know, some, some, someone can regulate cold fusion out of the picture and it probably is going to be the competing technologies that don't want cold fusion around. So uh, dealing with that whole regulation issue is going to be uh, something to be aware of, okay? Ignore, well, I've been ignored all the time when I've done fractal antennas, I'll get to that in a second. But it's one of the techniques that it's one thing to put out the innovation, it's another thing to get no response. Some of the others you've seen, the vaporware syndrome, which is your competitor says, oh, don't buy this new innovation because we're working on the same thing and it'll be out next year. Very common in, in a number of industries. Uh, a basic resource monopoly. I don't know if you've even thought about this one, so let me point it out to you. Many, but not all, of the cold fusion techniques you've referred to use palladium. So where is palladium mined? South Africa? Montana. Montana. You know the company in Montana? Yeah, Stillwater Mining, okay? Now what if Stillwater Mining decides that they no, want, no longer want to sell palladium for cold fusion? I'm not saying they're going to do that. I'm really saying that there is some sensitivity to who controls the basic resource that you need in order to do your stuff. You can't always assume it's going to be a free market and always available. If you look at what the PRC has done with the solar energy market and the rare earth mines, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They decided to control the resources and that made it virtually impossible to make the competitive solar energy products in the United States. Uh, just quickly, a stasis buy-in and therefore the buy-out. Stasis means everything stays the same. What I mean by that is you got a company, say it's a coal fusion company. A big company comes along and partners with you. Wonderful day. This is great. We're going to get the resources we need. We're real. It's going to happen. Guess what? You sign the contract and nothing really happens. And it goes on for years and years and years. So rather than innovation getting to the end user, it stops you from getting the end user. Similarly, there's a stasis buyout. The buyout means they buy out your company. They set up a little lab. They look at the lab. And they eventually phase it out. Now, this does happen. I don't know if you folks have seen that, but I certainly have. All right, well, let's talk about some of the, the fear factor issues here. This one on the left is. Uh, is the geodesic dome in, uh, in Montreal burning. 
And uh, if that doesn't scare the heck out of you, it scares the heck out of me. There's a fear factor. I don't want to put a geodesic dome up. It's going to burn. I can't put sprinklers up 300 feet high. And that does come up. When people want to build one-story structures of geodesic domes, they're always hit now with this idea, well, how are you going to get the fact that if it burns, you can't put it out? Uh, the one on the right there is a little hard to see, but that's an elephant. It's an elephant being electrocuted. I'm sure some of you folks can tell me what elephant that is or who did it. Thomas Edison did it. That's Thomas Edison. Thank you. That's Thomas Edison using uh, Westinghouse slash Tesla's alternating current to show how dangerous alternating current was. It could kill an elephant. Well, of course, DC could kill an elephant too, but the takeaway, and look, he showed a motion picture of it. He actually filmed it. He used that to try to discourage, and in fact, he was successful for several years, the widespread adoption of AC. Uh, poor uh, Bucky Fuller put up with so many of these issues. Here's another example. He obviously was the inventor of the geodesic dome, or one of the inventors of the geodesic dome. Uh, this is his Dimaxion car. Uh, the Dimaxion car was a marvelous innovation in the 1930s. It kind of looks like a a weird version of a VW bus from the 1960s. Had all kinds of innovations, rack and pinion steering, obviously streamlined. This were the cars you had of the day. It was a big hit, uh, the Chicago World's Fair. Unfortunately, the day after the World's Fair was over, someone ran this off the road and killed the driver. So suddenly, the Dynaxion car was dangerous. The result of that, the outcome, is that, uh, is that Bucky Fuller had the cancellation of a contract he had with Chrysler. He actually never came back from it. The point is, is that uh, sabotage was done. Create a problem to instill a fear. It really does happen. All right, here's another example. And I, if you're interested in GMOs one way or the other, I strongly recommend that you try to dig into this story. Uh, GMO wheat was uh, devised by uh, Monsanto. Uh, 20 years ago with the, with the idea of making it so that it worked well with a specific insecticide called Roundup. They discovered that the yields weren't high enough, so they stopped using it. It never made its way to market. They said, we still have to improve this, never went anywhere. Well, someone broke into the warehouse and took the seed and, and planted it. Apparently, it's not too hard to get uh, wheat to take, uh, to take seed. And this created this, this fear that here's this GMO product that's now mixing with regular wheat and it's contaminated and so on. Uh, it was a clear case of sabotage. Again, I want to invite you to go check that one out in a little more detail. All right, let me talk about um, patent naming, napping. I want to give you an example. Uh, not all companies <coughs> innovate and get patents in order to push the product ahead. A lot of times they do it to prevent other people from doing it. And here's an example where you may have a case where a company has made a fractal golf ball. That is, all the dimples are fractal shaped. It has less drag, by the way, so it does go further. Uh, it was patented in 1998, expires in 2017, and you can't buy a fractal golf ball. Well, who innovated this golf ball is actually the same one that sells Titleist golf balls and sells more golf balls than anyone in the world which is a Kushnet. Now, in fairness to Kushnet, I did try to call them and get a response, and they didn't respond to me. So I don't know if this is their motivation. But from the outside, in my opinion, it looks that way, that they basically patented the fractal golf ball to prevent someone else from coming up with a better golf ball and therefore biting into their market share. So it isn't just the patent office offering delays that does patent napping. It's also uh, especially large companies that will sit on technology. All right, my point is that most innovations, frankly, upwards of 90% of them fail for the folks that innovated it. It's tragic reality. Many of these innovations are resurrected later with different players. You know, if you have come up with an idea and then implemented it as innovation, that breaks your heart because they're basically taking your baby away. And that's assuming you're still alive. Uh, this invites the notion of innovation put on hold this idea of hibernation of a innovation or hibernation, And the thing that's relevant there, other than the fact that it's a coined term, is these time scales, and I've done this over uh, about 100 cases, are 10 to 30 years. 
So if you're a typical American, you assume that an innovation is going to catch on right away. The reality is, is that it doesn't catch on the right away. It takes decades, even in modern times, with great communication to get innovations to catch on. All right, let me finish up here. Uh, so let me talk about co-fusion just a little bit. And you've heard a lot of this from other folks. So I, I don't want to take away from the fact that they've come up with these insights, but I, I'm happy to reinforce them. Um, here's where I think the vulnerabilities are for co-fusion as an innovation. There's a failure to live up to expectations, meaning, you know, where's my one cent per kilowatt hour with the trash can that works for 10 years that is not part of, uh, of the power mains. Don't say that anymore. Please stop it. You're building people's expectations in a way that you can't match in a short period of time. And the result of that is there's going to be a fear of use, meaning whatever I use now, it's not going to meet that expectation, so why should I waste my time? It's not a credible technology. That's the kind of response you're going to get. The other, I mentioned the danger from radiation. Give me a break. There's, there's so little radiation happening here. Uh, for anyone to get hurt by it, they'd have to really, you, you'll, you tell me. You know, who knows? Explosions. That's going to be the number one fear factor. You've got to fight. You've got to show that these things do not explode, or if they do break down, it's about the same thing as a water heater leaking. Stasis buy-ins or buy-outs. I have a real fear that a lot of you who are doing wonderful, innovative work as companies are going to end up either making contract with a large company and have it no, go nowhere, or they're going to buy you out and it's going to go nowhere. Patent napping. Please appreciate the fact that the gold rush is on. People are filing patents on cold fusion. It's no longer considered an issue for the people filing as to whether cold fusion is accepted in the patent office. There are people in this audience who have spent years and millions of dollars trying to get their patents across. It's horrible what you, th what you went through. But for some reason that we'll never know, there's been a change in the patent office and they're issuing patents on cold fusion. And other people have noticed this. So I'm just going to end here because it's a long talk. I appreciate your time. Happy to describe any of these in any other detail after, after the chat. Thank you. <laughs>